country. He was not an invited speaker. But the big delegates, big philosophers from all over the world were talking about world religions. Vivekananda went up to the platform and said this. Brothers and sisters, we who come from the east have sat here on the platform day after day and have been told in a patronizing way that we ought to accept Christianity because Christian nations are the most prosperous. We look about us and we see England, the most prosperous Christian nation in the world, with her foot on the neck of 250 million Asiatics. We look back into history and see that the prosperity began with the invasion of Mexico. Christianity wins its prosperity by cutting the throats of its fellow men. At such a price, the Hindu will not have prosperity. I have sat here today and I have heard the height of intolerance. I have heard the creeds of the Muslims applauded when today the Muslim sword is carrying destruction into India. Blood and sword are not for the Hindu, whose religion is based on the laws of love. And he sat down. Clever. Very, very clever. You see, he did his homework. He understood the Western mind much better than the Western mind understood the Eastern mind. And that applies till this very day. Do you notice what he's done? He's taken the abuse of Christianity as meaning Christianity. And he has ignored the abuse of Hinduism and treated a pristine version of it. What would Vivekananda have said when Graham Staines, the missionary with his two boys, were put into his vans a few years ago in Orissa and kerosene doused on that van and the van set ablaze and the missionary and his two boys are burned to death. Is that Hinduism? Oh, Hindus claim to do it. Much of that will even go on today. Why is it that Christianity is judged by its abuse? In other words, religions are judged in their pristine fashion. But that's precisely what happened. And the university doors were swung open to Vivekananda in the early 1900s. The man was a brilliant man, but I've covered his life, covered some of the aberrations on it. And uh, where exactly things started to fall apart. But I don't have time to go on. Vivekananda was one of them. Yogananda was another. A contemporary of Vivekananda. The, the name Ananda is oftentimes put onto a guru's name. Because Ananda means joy. And so they'll. Vivekananda. Life, the joy of life. Yogananda. You know. The, the joy of yoga. And things like that. And so on. And you'll have this. Uh, um, these, the, that kind of appendage oftentimes. But your, your Yogananda. With this. Flowing locks of black hair. Very impressive looking man. Nuanced it in a different way with Hinduism. He would wear a cross around his neck. He was a disciple of a man called Ramakrishna. Who was one of India's most famous gurus. Who died in his 40s of throat cancer. That came about, they say, from two things. The addiction to betel nut. Which, uh, which causes throat cancer and the incredible spasms his body would go into when he was levitating and uh, carrying his meditation into some intense forms that almost resembled some kind of epileptic fits of some sort, but it was part of his religious routine. And in his 40s, Ramakrishna died. Yogananda was the disciple that he picked as his ultimate successor. Vivekananda, Yogananda, you and I may not be too familiar with that. The Indians are, the Westerns, the Westerners may not be. But Maharishi Mahesh Yogi of the 60s, Transcendental Meditation, we all know his name and how he came about and basically caught the West in a stress-filled life. We were running, 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 making money. And he devised a very clever scheme of telling us how to stop running and took the money from our pocket into his pockets in order to tell us how to vegetate and meditate. One of his premier disciples was Deepak Chopra. Deepak Chopra was a follower of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. At that time, he was a practitioner in medicine in Boston. And Chopra did something incredible for the Eastern spiritual movement with his knowledge in medicine and his, what I would call somewhat sophomoric understanding of the sciences. He blended that along with a little touch of quantum theory, which Richard Dawkins mocked in a dialogue with him. And Chopra did a very poor job at defending why he even uses quantum. He said, well, I use it as a metaphor. And Dawkins just looked at him, use it as a metaphor. So he blended wellness, touch of science, spirituality, and he did something incredible. You know, life has its boxes. We live in a box. We drive in a box. We give gifts in a box. 
We do all these things in a box and ultimately we are carried out in a box. (laughs) Because things are ultimately contained in some way. Chopra was brilliant. He gave his belief no name. The Hindu philosophers have really railed against him for this because he has marvelously leveraged Hinduism, but he doesn't call it Hinduism. He calls it Sanatan Dharma, which literally means the eternal dharma, the eternal religion. So you can't box him in. You can't critique him from Hinduism. You can't critique him from Buddhism. You can't critique him from Taoism. You can't critique him from anyism. How many people want to critique Sanatan Dharma? The eternal religion. Deepak Chopra took this and he blended together two or three things. And I want you to listen to me very carefully now. He took our hunger for wellness. Who doesn't want to be well? He took our longing for wellness and said there were ways in the ancient wisdom that did it all very well. And so we go back to those. And I'll tell you what, I was born and raised in India. I know that system very well. Ayurvedic medicine coming from the science of health. Goes back to natural ways and natural potions and natural potents, and there's a lot of good in it. There's a lot of strength in the herbs. There's a lot of strength in the oils. Uh, I have very serious back problems. Many of you know I've had two critical back surgeries. I've got two metal rods that bracket me from L3 to S1. I'm fused, and that those metal rods there with eight screws bolting me in. And the only thing that's actually really helped me in a palliative way is to use some of those anti-inflammatory oils, which I use for massage therapy. And there's absolutely no doubt that there's relief, but it's only palliative. It's not corrective. It didn't correct anything in my skeleton. And there are various ways in which you can find relief. But some of the biggest struggles that they will have in the East in these ways, they come to the West for Western medicine to help correct. Somewhere in the middle is the balance. And any time you go to either extreme, you actually do disservice to both of them. But Chopra capitalized on this hunger for wellness. How many don't want to be relieved of pain? I don't know anybody who doesn't want to be relieved of pain. How many don't want to be finding a less invasive way to get better? We all long for this. I remember my father, who was severely asthmatic, he used to stand in front of the window and literally lift his nostrils trying to breathe. For 20 years, he lived wheezing every night to sleep. And an Ayurvedic doctor met him and told him, if you go to Hyderabad, over a thousand miles away from where we lived in Delhi, and if you stand in line, there's a particular guru. My dad was a Nottingham-trained student. He studied at the University of Nottingham. He held a very high post in the government of India as a deputy secretary in the State Department, what we call the Home Ministry. My dad was not foolish. He just hungered for wellness in this situation. If you go to Hyderabad, there's a guru who comes out one time of a year and just before dawn, at at the the early moments of dawn, he will take a tiny little fish and put a mixture of spices in it and he will give it to you. You swallow it three years in a row. If you do this, you'll be rid of that problem. My dad went three years in a row over a thousand miles to Hyderabad to swallow that fish. He still struggled terribly all his days till we moved to Toronto in the 60s. And they found out what the allergies were, and my dad never had an asthmatic attack after that when he moved to Toronto. It's a true story. True story. I'm just saying this to mitigate the claims. They are extreme. But I want you to listen carefully now. What is it that Eastern spirituality actually means? Here's what it says. By the way, pages of they tell you what it is not. Anytime a person takes hours to tell you what something is not, you can probably be sure because they're not quite sure what it actually is. So here it is. Spirituality is an attitude of fearlessness, a sense of adventure. It is a way of looking boldly at life we've been given. Now, on earth, as this human being, who am I? How should I live my life? What happens when I die? Spirituality is nothing more than a brave search for the truth about existence. Nothing more, but nothing less as well. The Buddhist defines spirituality as shamatha, or tranquil abiding. As Christians, we need to be able to respond to the rising wave of new spirituality. We hope you'll join us next week as Ravi concludes his message on the topic and shares how we can respond to the challenges of today's modern-day gurus. You've been listening to Ravi Zacharias in a message titled, Uncovering the New Spirituality. 
If you enjoyed today's program, be sure to check out Ravi's newest book, Why Jesus, in which he takes an in-depth look at the new spirituality and shows us why Jesus is still the only answer to life's questions. To purchase a copy of the book or the broadcast you've just heard, call us at 1-800-448-6766 and request the program by name. That number once again is 1-800-448-6766. Or you can order online at rzim.org, where you'll also find free resources. And if you'd like updates and articles sent right to your email inbox, why not sign up for one of our digital publications? Find out more today at rzim.org. And the next time you're online, we hope you'll take a moment to check out RZIM's YouTube channel, where you'll find video interviews with Ravi and additional members of the RZIM team, including John Lennox and Stuart McAllister. Simply go to YouTube.com and search for the channel RZIM Media. If you have access to NRB TV, you can watch Ravi Zacharias on our Let My People Think television program. NRB TV is found on channel 378 on Direct TV or channel 126 on Sky Angel. Be sure to check your local listings for broadcast times. To contact us by mail or to make a donation, write to RZIM, Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. And please be sure to include the call letters of this radio station when you contact us, as that information helps us determine the effectiveness of this broadcast. That address once again is RZIM, Post Office Box 921-939, Norcross, Georgia, 30010. Join us again next week for more from author and apologist Ravi Zacharias. Let My People Think is a listener-supported radio ministry and is furnished by Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, Atlanta, Georgia.